Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello, everyone. We have a very informative show today. I want to first thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Culinary School Stories podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. And if you have not yet subscribed, please do so. It is free, and we would love to have you as part of our community. You can subscribe through your favorite podcast app, such as Apple Podcasts, which comes preloaded on all iPhones, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or etc., or through our website at www.culinaryschoolstories.com, which is also where we store all of the podcast past episodes and guest bios contact info. So be sure to check out the website and sign up for our monthly newsletter. Well, I'm excited to welcome today's guest to the show. He is currently a senior culinary arts manager for Marriott International, belongs to numerous professional organizations, and has won quite a few culinary competitions, including Guy's Grocery Games on the Food Network's TV show. And so without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Chef Ashton Garrett. Ashton, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chef. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so I know we got a lot to talk about, so let's start right at the beginning, which in your case was super young. I was reading your bio, and you say that cooking has been part of your life since you were three years old. Tell us about that. All right, yes, yeah, Chef. So uh, I kind of just, you know, got my start early, early on, uh, scared the heck out of my, my parents. Um, you know, like seeing a kid start, you know, that early with a uh, factuation for, you know, cooking. So um, I used to do it all, you know, I used to steal pots and pans and play with them, you know, and, and just do different things. And my mom had to, you know, strap some, uh, some bells to my shoes throughout the house to know where I was because I always, you know, would uh, mischievously get into different things like that. So um, I, I kind of got my start, you know, easy bake oven straight out the, you know, the gate. Um, my, my father got, uh, my parents got me that for Christmas and uh, baked all the desserts in one day. Um, it was just an extraordinary <laughs> experience, you know, watching the batter transform, you know, throughout the oven and, um, you know, creating the, smelling the aromas, you know, that was like on, on the early onset, my my favorite um, aspect of culinary, you know, like getting in, involved in cooking. And then from there, uh, it was a culinary play set, you know, I'm making fake bacon, flipping fake pancakes, you know, I had a cash register, you know, I would, um, you know, play with, play with it for hours on in while, you know, my brother and my friends are outside playing, you know, in the yard like regular kids do. You know, I'm in the in the house flipping imaginary pancakes and, and sizzling with imaginary bacon. So, um, yeah, it just it, it kind of started. Um, I, I honestly can't tell you where it all came from. It just came together. Um, it was just a, a passion and a purpose. Um, and uh, being in the kitchen makes you know it's a safety net. Um, it's where I feel most comfortable. Um, even on a professional level, and you know, it's always been something that I've just dove into and and for the last uh let's see uh, 20 years now it's it's been you know a, a place where it's always been like okay that's ashton garrett's zone so uh that's kind of like the, the early on story and you know cooking in my, with my mother in, in the kitchen cooking with my father in the kitchen my grandparents in the kitchen uh family reunions family events you know all of that you know on the early onset has just been tremendous awesome now tell me how that materialized throughout your like high school years? Did you participate in high school? Did you belong to, you know, clubs? Did you cook? Right. And, and did you have a job? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, while I was uh, in middle school, I kind of went through, um, my, my parents enrolled me in summer culinary classes. Um, so I went to like a vocational culinary school where they just specialized just in culinary. So um, this was like middle school heading into high school. So we would just work on small things like how to make spaghetti primavera. Or um, I remember uh, working peanut brittle and making peanut brittle for the very first time. Oh. And how interesting and awesome that was and um, kind of, you know, how to learn how to measure recipes, how to develop recipes. So um, that was, you know, more so like one or two days out the week. And then when I got to high school, we had a vocational program, a chef prep program uh, for prospective students who want to be in the culinary industry um, and, and make it a career. And that kind of molded you for that next transition, whether it's 
um, a vocational culinary school, you know, Johnson and Wales, CIA, you know, Scafia, things like that. Or if you just want to go out to the industry, at least you have that knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, you know, you earned your serve safe uh, the, um, certification. And if you wanted to, you know, we uh, also had ACF certifications as well. So that was kind of like, you know, like that high school transition. My first ever high school job uh, was I was a sophomore. I think I want to say 15 to 16 years old. I was a uh, actually before that I worked at a catering facility. Um, my mother, who was a phenomenal wedding decorator, she uh, knew the owner of a catering facility and uh, kind of got me that job, you know, and uh, I was a dishwasher. Um, very, very, you know, taught me humility straight out the gate. Um, taught me respect, not only respecting others, but respecting the kitchen, you know, how to how to utilize and cross utilize things like that. And then so I guess that was kind of my, you know, early onset doing weddings and banquets, and things like that. And then we transitioned. Um, I, I kind of just um, transitioned into a full scale fine dining restaurant that we had in Akron, Ohio. That's where I'm from. And uh, I, I worked there. I was a deep cleaner. And uh, as you might know, chef, that's kind of like the lowest on the brigade. So, yeah, I was, you know, scrubbing floors, scrubbing, you know, wherever the guests might see or even, you know, kind of kind of keeping the um, the uh, the equipment appreciated, you know, so it doesn't depreciate throughout, you know, as easily and kind of scrubbing things and then graduated, actually got promoted to a dishwasher, you know. So I tell people that all the time. You're like, yeah, man, you started below a dishwasher. Yes, exactly. So I was a, a deep cleaner and, uh, you know, got promoted to dishwasher and, uh, you know, the prep cook and, you know, banquet cook. And then uh, originally I was on the line and I was the youngest ever out of the entire company to be on the line. And then awesome. a year later I was promoted to lead line cook. So um, yeah, my, you know, definitely, definitely, you know, keeping my head down. Uh, yes. Chef mentality, learning, you know, the ropes. Um, uh, it, it's like I said, it's taught me humility. Um, it taught me a lot of respect um, and, and, you know, really appreciation for, for the chef role. There's nothing wrong with being a dishwasher. That's where I started and a lot of other people started in this industry. Exactly. And it, it does help build that foundation. You know, you have that appreciation for all positions in a kitchen. Exactly. Okay. So now you're getting out of high school. You know, this is going to be your career. You're going to go to school. You're in Ohio. How did you pick Johnson and Wales, right. specifically the Miami campus? Tell us that pro. How many schools did you look at? Which ones did, how did you finally make that decision? Yes. Uh, actually, Chef, that's a great question and an interesting question that, you know, I, I always tell people. Um, actually, I um, I have family down in Florida and my parents or my entire family, we traveled down there pretty often, whether it's going on cruises or just, you know, kind of vacationing. And so that was, you know, a, a lead, um, I should say, influence. Um, but I also looked at Johnson Wells Providence. Um, I also looked at CIA. CIA was actually where I wanted to go originally. Um, and I didn't take a campus visit. I kind of took a virtual tour, um, you know, on their website and things like that. I saw, saw what they had to offer and I, and I loved it. Um, and then, you know, very, this was all in eighth grade, chef, you know, I kind of wanted to make up my mind, you know, like pretty, pretty soon. Like, this is what I wanted to do. I was just looking at culinary schools and uh, I saw Johnson and Wills, North Miami actually come from a newsletter in the guidance office of my high school uh, or my middle school, I should say. And um, I kind of just looked at it and, you know, researched it online. And I said, wow, this is where I wanted to go. Mainly for, for one or two things, why I wanted to choose, why, excuse me, why I wanted to attend Johnson and Wills, North Miami. Uh, one, the diversity. Um, I, you know, the diversity was was incredible. You know, the, the rate at which it was um, growing as well as, you know, um, I, I just love being around diverse people. I um, mean, just I think it brings a wealth of ideas, a wealth of perspective, uh, you know, a wealth of uh, innovation. And also the second, I actually want to be on a, a cruise ship, Chef. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, like I said, my parents have been on 30 plus cruises. My brother and I have been blessed to be on probably, I want to say like five to 10. Um, and you know, I kind of just, you know, I was like, wow, you know, the opportunity to travel, the cook different cuisines, um, you know, to be, to be, um, like I said, to be on a, on a boat that's constantly revolving. So I thought that was a cool idea and, you know, no better place to be in Miami, you know, with the cruise port, you know, right, right down there. So that was kind of a driving factor as well. And, but ultimately when I got down there, you know, I had chefs, even like yourself, Chef LaCostra, um, you know, Chef uh, Kopsik kind of give me some more perspective um, and, and tell me to branch my wings out a little bit more. So that's kind of what I, I veered away from the cruise ship industry a little bit, but we'll, we'll talk about that later on. But, um, you know, those were some driving factors. And, you know, a lot of people say like, yeah, you know, was, was the sun, you know, like the weather, the weather right. exactly <laughs> the weather driving factor. I'm, yeah. You know, that's always, that's always a, a great factor, you know, especially coming from Ohio where you, know, you, you see snow often. So, but yeah, that was definitely a great factor. 
Now you mentioned diversity being a you know a factor in your decision. Did you find diversity at the other schools that you looked at, like CIA, Providence? Did you find it there or or not? No, uh, yes, I did. Yeah, um, more so like Providence. You know, CIA I think does extremely well in molding their students for you know the, the next level, whatever that's that's going to be. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, the the reason why you know CIA was at the top of my list was the alumni association was so strong. You know, and um, the ACF you know alumni association you know that that um, kind of parlayed into the CIA was de- a definite and prominent factor. Um, I didn't. Me personally, I don't think I went into depth that much to see about their diversity scale. Um, you know, Johnson and Wells kind of promoted that on the early onset that they were, you know, the I want to say like one of the the number one, you know, uh, most diverse universities. So that was like, you know, it caught my eye, you know, fairly soon. Again, I'm I'm only in eighth grade, so that's that's you know, I'm, I'm just right. seeing this for the first time. And Miami, in Miami, is much more international than say Hyde Park or Providence exactly. and stuff. So there's a lot more cultures right. there. A melting pot of different diversity, exactly. So they, that was that was another driving factor too, Chef. Awesome. So did you go visit the campus first, or did you just go there blind, ready to go? I did. I went on a campus visit. Uh, we had like a culinary weekend uh, kind of thing, and that was tremendous. You know, just to see. And my parents urged me to do that, and, and I'm glad that they did. You know, just to because as you and I both know, you know, like relative, you know, culinary school um, in in general is. Um, not the the least expensive thing in the world. Yeah. So it was, you know, very important that that you see, you know, first where you're going to be staying, the faculty, um, you know, seeing the kitchens, you know, and, and what that did for me, it created perspective and also created my imagination um, for culinary. And it allowed me to see like, wow, you know, like seeing how, how you know, the, the chefs set up their kitchens and how the students operate and, you know, where I'll be eating and where the gym is. It kind of, you know, it, it made me imagine where, what I will be doing that ensuing year, you know? So I went my junior year of high school and uh, that kind of transitioned into, you know, that wildcat weekend kind of thing, I want to say. And my my mother went down with me um, and we, it was just a great time. You know, I met a lot of different students, international students, and, you know, kind of just interesting to hear their stories and perspectives and why they got into culinary in the first place. And that's, you know, I've kind of fell in love with the campus. Then I find, I I love, I fell in love with the, with this university then. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you you definitely want to go check out these schools first. I mean, you're paying a lot of money. You mentioned, right. I mean, you're buying like a you know a, a fancy European sports car there price. You wouldn't go buy it without even test driving it. So go see it and and, and exactly. get involved and see what it's all about and see if it fits because there's different campuses for everybody, right. different schools for everybody. Exactly. So speaking about expensive, did you? Uh, did you apply for scholarships? Uh, how did how did that all work? How did you help pay for it? I mean, you knew in advance you were in eighth grade and high school, and you saw so you knew you had to save up. Did you apply for grants? Did the school give you money? How does how does one kind of alleviate some of that finance? Tell you what, Chef, um, that's a, a great question, and um, what's in particular, and I'm extremely blessed to be you know to say this. My parents helped me out tremendously. Um, and and I, I wouldn't be the chef I am today without without them. So mom, dad, if you're watching this, thank you so much for all that you've done. I really appreciate it. But um, chef, to be honest with you, uh, we started my sophomore year in high school, just applying for different scholarships. And to any young student now um, thinking about going into culinary school, start early. Please start early. Don't be the last to wait, you know, because when it comes around your junior year, senior year, after you're done taking the ACT, SAT, you know, you're kind of getting college fever, but you're not the only one getting college fever. You know, there's so many other students getting college fever. So that means there's a, a splurge and a rush to kind of apply for these scholarships. So that makes it even more compounded and more competitive um, in terms of getting a scholarship. So chef, I think in all, I applied for a little over 130 scholarships throughout my, wow. my yeah throughout my high school um, tenure, I should say. Uh, I was you know blessed enough to receive I want to say probably about 50 to 55 of that. I'm not sure to how much money that equates to, um, but it, it was de- it definitely helped me out you know with culinary school. And actually, the, the um, Johnson Wells did assist me in that. Uh, the uh, parent or sister organization, uh, FCCLA, um, uh, definitely you know helped me out and, and gave me a scholarship mm-hmm. with that as well. So um, keep your grades up. Study, 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 work hard, but but please start early, start often. You know, if any high school student watching this, 
Definitely, definitely. Want to you want to be ahead of the curve, a hundred percent. Yeah, because it is expensive, and but people should know that that's like the sticker price, right? You know, the, most schools, and that's true, and not just culinary, all universities. That's not the is the price you pay. It's always discounted depending on everyone's situation yep. and where you're coming from. So you know, look into it. Don't ever discount a school because you think it's too expensive. Go and go through that financial process and get those scholarships and grants. This institutional aid, but there's also specific ones to our industry, like from the National Restaurant Association, the American Culinary Federation, and local chapters. Right. So really explore those little niche type pockets. Um, did you find any 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 of those in the industry type scholarships? I did, yeah. So I, like I guess uh, in our National Restaurant Association, um, they're kind of like, yeah, they're, you know, they're, and that's another thing, you know, too, when, when you start early, it gives you that, you know, that ability to look and, and to be, you know, and, and to search and to find different things. Chef, we were finding stuff that, you know, men out of associated with culinary directly, but still in some way in a hospitality form. So just apply for it, you know, so stuff that I didn't even think would apply to me, mm-hmm. apply to me. And I, like I said, I was blessed enough to receive a scholarship like that. So I, off the top of my head, I'm, I don't remember the, the exact names of the scholarships um, or the associations, but there's definitely ones, you know, that, kind of correlate to culinary, but may not have that name or tag that deal with culinary, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, you know, just search, you know, so we did culinary scholarships, culinary school scholarships, hospitality, fine dining, you know, different things like that. You know, uh, S. Pellegrino gives a scholarship. Mentor BKB gives a scholarship. HCS, of course, or ACF, of course. Uh, World Association of Chefs Societies. You know, there's just so many, so much out there. You know, Pro Start, FCLA, DECA, um, you know, all these great organizations. I think James Beard Foundation does a clearinghouse, too. Is that? Oh, my gosh. Yes, Chef. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. James Beard, you know, plethora of scholarships, you know, with that organization. So it's out there. You know, you guys just have to, yeah. you know, buckle down and, and just keep looking. Because most people don't want to do the work. So if you do the work, you do the digging, you know, it's just filling out those applications, those essays. Sometimes you can use the same, you know, body of it and just one size it. fits all. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I know when I was going through school, same thing. I didn't have a lot of money. One of them I applied for was this. I forget the name of it, but it was a Presbyterian scholarship. Okay, well, I'm not pre- I'm not Presbyterian, right? But exactly. It never, but it never said in there you had to be. You had to be called. exactly. So right. I applied for it. I got it, and <laughs> four years in a row, and I'm like, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Presbyterian scholarship. Exactly. It, yep. And you know, I say that to say I'm glad you said that, Chef. You know, because that that can deter you away from not applying. You know, that you that you you know create a a conscious thinking that. You know, oh, this doesn't apply to me because it's, you know, this specific. But if it doesn't say, you know, like the, the rules don't apply. And like you said, you know, one 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 size fits all. So, but yeah, that's awesome, Chef. <laughs> Great. Okay, so you got to culinary school. You got it kind of paid for there a little bit. Let's talk about your classes. What was your first lab class? Were you scared? You already had a lot of experience. Were you above those students already in class? Were the chefs mean like some people think? Tell us about that experience. What's going through your head? This is uh, one of my favorite stories I always tell um, because it's it, it's you know, such such a nuance. Uh, my first ever class, chef, was uh, baking and pastry fundamentals. Mind you, you know I'm down there to cook. I, I want to be hands in, you know, neck deep in, in just culinary, full savory. You know, I want to do what the guys are doing on Food Network and what I see on Netflix and all this and with the fire and they're flipping and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, yeah, let me let me just say, because some people may not know when you go to culinary school and you're going for culinary arts, not baking and pastry, you still have baking and pastry. You still have exactly. in front of the house class. You have exactly. dining room, you have bartending, you have academics. So you right. may not get into that culinary exactly. lab right away. Right. And that was the thing, you know, like, so I had this mindset where I, you know, First thing in, we'll be sauteing, we're, we're cooking and doing all this, you know, like we're in the advanced level classes and things like that. So I get my schedule, you know, as every culinary student, student does, you know, based on their trimester. Um, and it says bacon and pastry fundamentals. And chef, my my morale went from 100 to like negative 100. I'm, I call my parents. I said, my first I quit. I, I'm out of here. I, 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 my first class is baking and pastry. I can't believe they do do this to me. I don't want to bake. I don't want to do this. Um, but a little backstory, chef. I, I I wanted to be a baker when I was little. You know, like oh. I, you know, with the Easy Bake Oven and everything like that. You know, um, I went to cake decorating classes. I baked brownies, which is my favorite dessert. You know, cookies for you know a local hair salon, my mother's hair salon. So I would sell you know my baked goods. So I, I loved everything baking. And as I kind of got older, um, 
my patience ran a little, ran, ran a little, ran a little dry. And of course, you know, to be a baking and pastry artist, you know, you, you have to appreciate that for one in which I do, I learned a new respect going down to Johnson and Wales mm-hmm. about baking and pastry, of course. Um, but also, you know, the respect about patience and, um, and how intricate it really is and how detailed it is. So, um, yeah, that was, that was kind of a little bit backstory, but, um, my first class, like I said, was baking and pastry, uh, chef Kevin Kopsick, a phenomenal instructor for anybody who, who may know him down at Johnson and Wells. And um, so I was there. Uh, I was there. I got there. I think class started at seven o'clock, chef. I want to say I got there at six 30. Um, I was <laughs> the first one, first one in the, in the class. And I'm thinking I'm in the wrong classroom because it's kind of, it's all right, six 45, six 50. You know, I'm not seeing, you know, many students and I see, you know, chef, chef stuff was already in there. You know, he was already set up. Of course. Um, he, I think he just stepped out to get a coffee or, or talk to some colleagues. So I was, you know, in the class, just thinking, just looking around like, man, like this is, this is bacon and pastry. Um, and of course the pastry labs are cold. So they're like, they're, they're cold for a reason, you know, to keep everything regulated at room temperature at a certain temperature. So I'm in there shivering, I'm like, man, this is, this is really, you know, not helping my case for wanting to be at Johnson and Wales right now. Um, but no, you know, my, my first class was amazing. You know, the students that were, that were involved there, um, like I said, diverse, you know, we had different students from Texas, California, um, some, you know, were indigenous in terms of being uh, from Miami, um, New York, you know, just all from all over the world, all over the country, as to say, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, kind of just back and forth, you know, having, you know, a small talk throughout the class and bouncing ideas off each other. Um, you know, we were there for a reason. We were there for a purpose. And um, it was it was great to be there. And you know, like I said, he was a phenomenal instructor still to this day is. Um, and I really appreciate his guidance you know, and, and helping me out for that. Mm-hmm. But it's so true. When you want to be a chef and you go to culinary school and you go into baking, you're like, uh, I did the same thing. It was the worst grade I got when I was in culinary school. I got, I think I, I was all A's, but I think I got a C or a C plus in classical right. bakes. And even the instructor come out to me and she was a German lady. She's like, you could do so much better if you apply yourself. Exactly. I'm like, yeah, I'm going hi- to hire a patient. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I, I don't want to yeah. do this stuff. And that's, that's the funny thing, Chef, if, if I may real quick. Um, Chef uh, Kopsik actually said that. He said, you know, although the majority of you actually want to be chefs, you know, a chef doesn't mean that you're just strictly just a chef. You know, you you need to be well-rounded. You need to understand, you know, the, the, the layers to being a chef. And that spoke volumes to me, even to this day, you know, and um, he said, you know, what, what happens when you have your pastry chef call off or your executive pastry chef can't make it, sure. you know, are you just going to shut down the kitchen or shut down the restaurant? You know, you potentially lose thousands of dollars. And um, as you and I both know, you know, the, the uh, our industry revolves around, you know, the money, you know, whether it's waste or, you know, keep keeping a certain, you know, P&L, you know, kind of standard. So, you know, that, like I said, that, that spoke volumes to me and that, and that ignited uh, a flame in me to want to learn and adjust myself to baking and pastry. Yeah, and the skills you learn, and they're so valuable to be a chef. You got to be well rounded. And even though you may not practice it or be a practitioner of that, you should understand it because those areas will be underneath, you know, usually your exactly. responsibility as well. So, the very least, just to appreciate it and what right. the level of skill, you know, people that, are, that really go into that have and what they can exactly. bring to the table for you. So. Okay, so what was your favorite class then? You got out of baking, now you get into finally get into some cooking classes, some culinary classes. Did you have a favorite and and why? I think Chef um Garmin J was definitely a favorite. Garmin J and um I have to say Garmin J and Meat Fabrication ah, were, were definitely, yeah, definitely some of my favorites. Um Garmin J, um just just understanding the creativity behind it, um, as well as the resourcefulness. You know, as Garmin J, you know, you kind of just in the, in the old school days, you know, you kind of those are the scraps and yeah. you just use yeah. the scraps to, you know, turn it into something. It, of course, forced meat. It makes some money. <laughs> exactly. It makes the money, you know, forced meats and, you know, different things like that. Pates, you know, so uh, learning how to do that and learning that skill um, and, and uh, understanding and respecting the true value of the word waste and how to alleviate waste, um, you know, and, um, you know, turning different things. Like, and throughout, you know, school, they teach you, um, okay, the scraps goes into a stock or, you know, we're composting or, you know, we can utilize that for a different class, you know, save, 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 you know, don't throw anything out that doesn't need to be thrown out, of course, um, unless, you know, it, it uh, infringes on HACCP or anything like that. So that for sure, Garmin J and the meat fabrication, you know, with Chef Alan Lazar at the time, you know, that was a tremendous, you know, class, you know, just learning the ins and outs. Your chef up until that point, you know, I only knew what was right in front of me. What I mean by that is, you know, I go to a restaurant, I order, you know, a salmon or a snapper. 
it just comes as is. You know, I, I'm not sure how the how the guys in the back are, are, are you know, filleting it or, you know, doing, uh, taking the scales off. You know, I, I saw in a video once, but to actually have it in front of you and seeing how to fabricate a Dover sole and a flatfish versus a round fish and, um, you know, cutting a chicken, you know, learning how to, you know, fabricate a chicken. So all these things, you know, in the early onset, you know, taught, teach you patience, a lot of our patience, finesse. Um, the technicality, you know, that it really takes to, you know, to create a great product. Um, and I, I've, you know, learned a lot from that. Mm. Yeah, it's so true. That class is, is valuable uh, uh, in a lot of different ways uh, as well. Can you speak to or tell the listeners a little bit about, you know, the the level of rigor? I mean, it's a college, it's university, and some people think culinary school, and there is probably some that doesn't have a lot of you know, assignments, homeworks, how, the, how hard it is for tests, but just to give them and it may be an impression of the labs of the academic classes you had to go through. How did you, how did you find them to be, you know, academic wise? Sure. Um, the first thing is I, I would like to say, um, if, if and there's any student that's getting involved in any higher level education um, or, or, you know, base uh, apprenticeship, I should say, um, two things that stand out more than anything is discipline and cons- uh, discipline and commitment. Um, so learning those two things throughout my entire, you know, tenure at Johnson Wells, you know, truly helped me out. But, um, to answer your question, chef, it, the, the classes definitely, you know, where ones, some are experiential, you know, for a reason and others are more academic. Um, but you know, you're not going to be in there, you know, learning, uh, just reading out of the book and, you know, kind of just doing that. That's more so on you, you know, as a student, you know, to learn like, okay, this is your book work research. While you're in class, you're doing applications, you know, you're doing the technicals, you're, you're hands on that, you know, I think that's what I appreciate about Johnston Wells is, you um, know, on the back end, you know, you're learning the academics, you know, from the, from the book, from the worksheets, from the, you know, the quizzes online. But while you're in class for those six or seven hours, you know, you're in class. So um, to kind of you give it a breakdown, you know, for the viewers watching. So I had, a, you know, Johnson Wells did an AM and a PM segment, you know, the seven to one thirty, I think uh, two to eight or like 130 to 730, I should say. So you had your choice of AM and PM. And uh, from there, you know, depending on, you know, your, your level of uh, comfortability and consistency, you know, you could just choose, you know, which, which segments you want to do. But it was well-rounded, you know, and, um, you know, like I said, bacon and pastry, chef, as you mentioned, food and beverage, beverage and hospitality. Uh, and that was an interesting class, too, in its own right, learning about the different terroirs, learning how wine is made, you know, the the, uh, the intricacies of, of just making a coffee. So, you know, how to make tea, tea service, uh, crepe Suzette, different things like that, you know, just just a wealth of knowledge. Um, and like I said, it helped being in a diverse atmosphere and creating, you know, um, a different level of perspective. Um, but on the academic side, I thought they were tremendous, you know, and they were relevant to what was happening now. And that's something I, I appreciated about Johnson and Wells is that we weren't learning something about 20 years or 30 years ago that might have happened that changed the industry dramatically. Although we did use that at a, at a, as a foundational level to, to build, um, it was nothing more so than just, OK, Ashton, this is how we use technology in, at Marriott International. And we would actually, you know, have a conversation with somebody who worked at Merit International in real time on how he or she implemented that into the business platform mm-hmm. um, and, you know, different things like that. So it was it was a tremendous experience, you know, and uh, learning so much really afforded me, you know, the opportunity to garner my degree and, uh, you know, be the young chef that I am today. Now, you went, you've got two degrees from there, right? You got an associate's degree, and that was like, I'm in culinary arts, and then you stayed on for a bachelor's degree. What did you get the bachelor's degree in? And, and looking back now, do you think it's worth it to get the degrees that you got? All right, and uh, that's, a, that's a great question, Chef, because a lot of my colleagues, you know, they were only in for their associates, you know, kind of just, I was want to learn the cooking fundamentals and then go out into industry. Um, you know, the reason I wanted to learn, um, you know, my bachelor's, in food and uh, food service and hospitality management. That's my bachelor's degree. Um, I had, I still to this day have aspirations of owning and operating my own restaurant. And to do that, I wanted to be real rounded in the business sense um, and, and learning about, you know, statistics and financials and, and management, uh, money management, time management, um, you know, all these things that parlay into a, a well-rounded business, you know, platform. Um, and I think that any chef can agree with me that, you know, as your chef, you're not just a chef, you know, anybody can get, put great food on a plate, but you need to learn about profit and loss, um, how to, you know, scheduling, um, 
waste logs, different things like that. All that affects the overall business sense, you know, target audience, location, different things like that. Stuff that we learn in your class, chef, you know, cost control and management, you know, things when we do in the sim, you know, the, the dreadful sim simulation <laughs> at the end, you know, that, that so many people, you know, didn't like, um, but I appreciated it, you know, even though, you know, sometimes I would, I would fail and stumble, but, but it taught me Every time I would fail and stumble, I learned a lesson on how not to do this. You know, maybe I shouldn't open my restaurant over here now because of X, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so. So um, I wanted to stay on, like I said, uh, my bachelor's uh, just to learn, you know, be a well-rounded chef, you know, um, and it's, it is profit me, you know, it helped me out tremendously. Now to say, um, unfortunately, in the, in the current unprecedented times now, you know, where, you know, the jobs may not be as, you know, fluctuating um, as, as they once were. Um, it can be, you know, daunting for a young chef to, to think like, okay, do I really need this? And uh, what I say to that is really just sit down, plan out your year, plan out the next five, 10 years where you would like to be. You know, one great thing about our industry is that it changes every day, you know, sometimes for the bad, sometimes for the good, but even in the bad, you can learn from that and grow from that, um, you know, develop yourself and develop your character and your professionalism. Um, but for me, like I said, chef, you know, it was a about being well-rounded, being in a business perspective, learning the different things, you know, that go into making a business and creating a business from the startup. You know, we had an entrepreneur, uh, an entrepreneurship class, and that was probably one of my best, uh, excuse me, my favorite academic classes um, was just learning things about the back end, you know, and learning the sweat equity, the time, the, uh, the frustration that it goes into just building something from the ground up, but also how rewarding it is, you know, to see it go from, just a plan on a piece of paper to manifesting yourself into something bigger and brighter than that. So um, it really just, you know, depends on the chef. You know, like I said, I have colleagues that only went in for two years. I've had some that, you know, went for the associate's degree and dropped out and, you know, are doing extremely well, just doing their own things. Um, I've had others, like I said, chef, you know, that are have masters and their PhDs and, um, you know, they're not where they want to be right now, but they're still, you know, making strides towards there. So, you know, it just depends on, on what you want to do. What about the, the aspiring culinarian that's out there, maybe working, thinking about going to culinary school and, and they're hearing from people, you don't need culinary school. I mean, just stay here. We'll teach you everything. Go to the school of hard knocks. Why spend all that money? Have that right. debt. Why not just learn it through the ranks? Like, you know, the old model from Europe, you know, apprenticeship mm -hmm. model. What do you, what do you think about that? Can you co compare, contrast the two and Certainly. And I was posed that question too. I asked one of my mentors, you know, like, is, is this really worth it? You know, it's culinary school really worth it. And I think the biggest thing um, that students look at, of course, when it comes to culinary school or any higher level, you know, education or apprenticeship is the cost. That's like the biggest thing, you know, you can have aspirations, you can work at the Greenbrier, you can go to CIA, Johnson and Wells, all these, you know, great coveted institutions. And, you know, that have, um, created, you know, an alumni of tremendous chefs, tremendous, you know, um, hospitality industry leaders and, and just, you know, have your imagination full. And then, but you see that cost and that just takes everything away. You know, it just, you know, just kills your entire motivation. So what I say to that is, you know, just find out what you like to do first. And um, for me, it was all about getting in the industry early. So um, for this, you know, the student, the prospective students that are looking to go into culinary school, you working in the industry is already a leg up. And, uh, you know, you, and I tell people this all the time, I tell culinary students all the time, get into the industry first and foremost. Before you think about any culinary school, make sure that this is what you want to do. And I don't care if it's working at Applebee's or Olive Garden or even like a fast food kind of, you know, restaurant, McDonald's, Burger King, whatever the case may be, get into the industry, understand the rigors, understand the, you know, the, the vocabulary that's being used, understand the language, understand, you know, the time, the discipline that it takes, you know, to become a cook and then eventually become a chef, um, you know, learn the ins and outs of the business as much as you can. And the only way to do that is to dive into it. Um, like I said, my first job was a deep cleaner um, and it taught me to be extremely humili you know, uh, humilitous um, and understand, you know, a certain level of discipline that it takes to become an ultimate chef. And, um, you know, I'm very fortunate. I had a great executive chef, you know, where I worked, you know, who taught me those things and taught me those aspects. And, you know, it's very frustrating. It's very difficult. It's very hard. Um, but you ultimately want to want to find out what you want to do. You know, culinary school for me, um, it, it, it celebrated and opened up a different perspective uh, for diversity inclusion. Um, I think that I would not be the chef I am today without culinary school. I think that, you know, some of the opportunities might have come, but maybe not as quickly um, because of that. 
And, uh, you know, it also means on what you want to do. I think for certain experiences, certain um, job outlooks, certain, you know, obligations, if you want to be in healthcare, definitely want to go to culinary school, you know, because now you're dealing with dietary, nutritional, um, you know, you need to learn how to cost, you know, manage things like that, which you can always do, you know, learning, but may not be as quickly, you know, if you want to do private chefing, um, you know, you see a lot of that nowadays, chef, you know, it, somebody might be a home cook and, you know, they're doing some things for, for a dinner and they're turning into private chefs. So I say to, to that, you know, really just figure out what your niche is. You know, if you want to go to culinary school and, and have a different experience, you know, for me, it gave me my friends, you know, and you hear that a lot, you know, you get a social platform, it gave you, you know, uh, things like that. But more than that, um, it taught me how to be an individual outside of culinary arts. You know, more than that, I had to define myself as Ashton Garrett. And the only way I could do that was to get out and do something differently um, in in an environment that was foreign to me, you know, and and it allowed me to grow character within myself. So, you know, if you're okay with where you are and you just want to build up the ranks and move up the ranks, absolutely. You know, but if you want a different experience, if you want to, you know, learn different things, you know, if you want to move forward, it's culinary school, um, you know, necessary to be a great chef? Absolutely not. You know, but is it, you know, leg up? Sure. You know, but you just need to weigh, you know, apples or oranges for that. Yeah, it's personal. Everyone's got to make that decision based on their situation and you know where their goals are. Exactly. Cool. So you talked about diversity, diversity at the school at Johnson & Wales in Miami. You just mentioned it again. So let's talk about that. Do you find there's a lot of diversity in the industry now that you're out there. And and have you seen anything like discrimination? Do you see that happening? Has it affected you, whether that's in school or out there in the industry? Um, I, uh, I actually just published, you know, a recent article for the National Culinary Review on the same topic, national, you know, culinary uh, diversity. Um, I would like to think that, you know, most chefs that are, you know, in this industry now are celebrating diversity and embracing it, which I think that they are, and coming into it in a well-rounded viewpoint. Um, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Um, it just depends. Me personally, I've been extremely blessed and fortunate to work in kitchens that celebrate diversity and have diverse individuals, whether it's from you know the executive level all the way down to a more you know um, a, uh, a more elementary role. Um, but nonetheless, I think you know as the certain and um, current events, social, economic, you know, political that have kind of unfolded in, in these past years um, have given, you know, some consciousness and enlightenment, you know, to certain chefs and certain industries, you know, to kind of celebrate and open up diversity. Um, the first being, you know, just, just kind of a blatant example outside of culinary arts, you know, venture capitalists are now funding more to, you know, African and more Latino, you know, American, um, you know, uh, entrepreneurs. So that, that probably would not have happened if the unfortunate realities didn't occur within these last two or three years, might have happened, of course, you know, maybe down the stream, uh, down later in the stream, but, but if not, then, then, um, but yeah, I, you know, chef, you know, it, it's, um, it's a sticky topic that I always, you know, kind of teeter totter with, uh, like I said, I would like to, to say that they are, but unfortunate reality, you know, sometimes it's not, you know, um, for instance, women, you know, women of color, you know, even women in this industry, you know, are still being disenfranchised, um, you know, still kind of being pushed to the side a little bit, whether that's with equal pay um, or just respect in the industry in, in general. Um, but there are some trailblazers out there, you know, that are, that are continuing to push. Um, I think um, Chef Kimberly Brock Brown is, is a perfect example of that. And she was on on this, uh, you know, podcast as well, helping out Dominique Crin, you know, out in San Francisco of uh, you know, uh, her restaurant, you know, what, what she's doing with women. So it's, it's just been, you know, a, a plethora of, of different initiatives being, you know, happening or happening now, you know, for the push, you know, to, to embrace diversity, to embrace inclusion, uh, whether it's racial, gender, you know, a religious, whatever the case may be, I think, um, you know, because food knows no gender chef, you know, and knows no discrimination, knows no age, you know, bias and things like that. You know, it just knows to, to exist and to be appreciated. And, uh, you know, just as you and I, you know, we, we look different, of course, we have different backgrounds, but, you know, that doesn't discount from us, you know, I might want to learn our, you know, Ireland cuisine, you know, or Irish cuisine, you know, you might want to learn Western African, you know, we don't throw any bias, you know, with food. So why, why should we do that with each other? So that's kind of some things that, you know, I, I tell people with that. Right. Um, and for me personally, like I said, chef, I've been able to be in diverse kitchens all across the world. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, like I said, it's given me a wealth of perspective and it's just been a tremendous experience. I haven't had uh, an experience with discrimination or racial, you know, and bias, um, 
which I'm very blessed, you know, to, to have that. Unfortunately, I do know colleagues that have gone through some things and it's deterred them away from certain aspects in this industry, which is unfortunate. Um, but as, as we continue to progress, I think, you know, two is always better than one when we come together and build together and we can achieve anything. Great. Uh, why don't we talk about taboos then? There's taboos in our industry that's been around haunting us for decades, and you're out there in the industry. Do you see them changing, getting better, getting worse? Maybe you could um, address that. Things like sexual harassment, uh, alcohol and drug abuse, mm -hmm. um, people getting divorced, and you know, sp relationship issues. Right. Uh, you know, even we've had suicides. Yeah. So, can you talk about those and see? Is it is the industry changing? Are they they making that better, or do you see it getting worse? You still see pockets of it. I think I think you know, um, change is always long you know it's very 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 long and it's through that it's strenuous it's difficult right um you know so that i don't think we'll ever be a hundred percent okay this is where it's at you know this is where we need to be in terms of you know eliminating and eradicating those taboos um are they still out there of course but are, are they i think they're being brought to light on social media i think there's been a lot of awareness a lot of you know great talks great conversation such as this you know um enlightening uh the the viewers and letting them know like hey like this is this is kind of what's going on you know and this is isn't just a local thing this is a global thing you know there's just the outstanding pressures that it has on an industry um i think the uh the biopic or excuse me the movie uh burns you know and, and it's of course it's fictional in the platform but i think it does an accurate um you know uh, depiction of portraying you know kind of those rigors um, that the actor Bradley Cooper, you know, kind of went through and, and goes through. So um, in my perspective, I think we're, we are, you know, at, at a point where it's kind of a turning point, you know, hey, like this isn't, you know, we, we want a better work-life balance. And I say we as, as active, you know, uh, whether it's employees or employees, you know, you want to, there's just so much around us, Chef. I think the advent of social media has helped us out, you know, with that, whether it's traveling and wanting to be with our families, um, our friends, wanting to be at different events, you know, not being behind the line for 16, 17, 18 hours a day, you know, which is kind of the unfortunate reality for, for most chefs. Um, but from a, a longer perspective, right, um, I think it's been brought to light at the right time. You know, I think uh, you know, throughout the entire perspective, the you know, sexual harassment and the alcoholism and, um, you know, the drugs and, you know, abuse and things like that have just been just is people are fed up chef, you know, to be honest with you. Um, and that's a generational change, mm -hmm. you know, where again, social media, the internet has kind of changed that and brought to light different perspectives. You know, for me, from what I've seen, you know, working at Marriott, they have no tolerance, you know, there's zero tolerance perspective on any of that, you know, and, and uh, of course, then not, not every establishment is perfect in their own right, but, you know, for, to work for a company in a position that believes so, so dearly into the health, the well-being and the health of their associates, you know, really helps me out. Um, and for one day, you know, building my restaurant, building my company, building my corporation, you know, I can model that off of that. So um, I think, I think the taboo still exists, um, but they're being exposed and they're being exposed every day. Yep. Good stuff. Yeah, it needs to. Let's change gears here. I want to talk about guys' grocery games. Okay. That was last year. You were the winner. Tell us about that. The listeners out there, you know, they just see it from the perspective of an audience, you know, watching these things. But maybe give us a little glimpse behind the scenes. What happens? I mean, sure. we see a half-hour show, but I'm sure it takes much longer to do all that filming and get right. you set up and makeup and all the directions. Can you go through that a little bit? I couldn't. Um, yes, yes, I, I can. I can say uh, just just a few things. You know, unfortunately, I, I'm not allowed to say the, the the whole the whole spiel. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's no, it's can't, no can't reveal the recipe. Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's okay. I, I I can say what, what I what I, uh, I I can say. Uh, it was a tremendous experience. Um, if there's any young chef out there, any chef in general that you know kind of just wants to try something new, try something different, you know, apply with whatever it is, you know, guys, grocery games, chopped. Um, you know, Iron Chef America, whatever it is, you know, kind of just, you know, put, put your foot out there and, and just see what you can do. So actually, Chef, how I got onto the show was a very interesting and kind of funny experience. So I was on a family cruise. Uh, I think we were in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, I want to say, or in the Caribbean. Um, and, uh, you know, I uh, I received like an Instagram, you know, DM and he 
you know, anybody who's on Instagram, you have direct, general, and like kind of where it says like, uh, like basically like spam in, in a certain way. That's the third category. And I, I saw a message, you know, come in that, in, in, in that, uh, in that category. And I, I clicked on it and it was a director, you know, she had reached out to me. She said, hey, Ashton, you know, I've, I've been, uh, we've noticed your work and, you know, we, it, we, we've followed you for some time. You know, we're wondering if you'd like to be a contestant on the show. And to be honest, Jeff, I was about to delete that entire message. Because, like I said, it went, <laughs> said there, it, that's fake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's fake. It went to my spam. I'm thinking like, yeah, there's no way. Like, OK, whatever. And um, I had a you know change of heart. It was like, you know, like my, my, my subconscious was just telling me, Ashton, go on LinkedIn. You're on LinkedIn a lot. You know, just just type in her name, see what pops up. And chef, you know, she extensive background, you know, she was, you know, directed for different channels, things like that. So I'm saying to myself, like, wow, this is this is, you know, legit. So um, with my parents and I, you know, we bought the Wi-Fi package on, on the boat. Mind you, we're in the middle of the, of the ocean. <laughs> and I had my first ever interview with them on a cruise ship. Um, and we had a, a conversation. And um, after several you know, uh, interviews later on you know, with different producers and things like that. Um, I was able to get on the show. So yeah, they, they, they do a tremendous job. The behind the scenes are just, you know, incredible, you know, meeting, meeting guy himself, meeting some of the judges, learning how they operate, how the producers operate. It's all like, it's like a, a huge orchestra, mm-hmm. you know, they, everybody's playing the position, everybody's playing a part, um, you know, and making the production as great as it is. You know, you have people that are being flown out for, you know, from third party companies, you know, to, to help, you know, run the production and, and system, things like that. I had no idea. Like you said, Chef, you know, we see things on TV just as they are. We see the final product, but to actually be behind the scenes and learning how, you know, what the, the hair and makeup is or what the, um, you know, how, how they choose outfits and color patterns, you know, for, for different contestants, um, you know, that, that kind of fits your style, that, that fit, you know, the, uh, the perspective of, or the character of the contestant it was it was incredible you know it's a fun experience and guy himself is an awesome guy you know as he is on camera is exactly how he is on off camera you know he's a tremendous you know humanitarian you know what he's been able to do for the culinary industry you know raising um a little north of 20 million dollars you know help out the culinary industry this year has been you know tremendous so you know he really cares you know dearly about our industry he's a phenomenal guy um you know, I'm, I'm glad to call him a mentor now, as well as the other judges, you know, the esteemed judges that were on the the, uh, the show. Um, but yeah, Chef, you know, it's just a phenomenal experience. You know, they. Uh, what do they do with all that food? Is, is it a real, it's not a real grocery store, so they don't use it all up. How, what do they do with it? Right. Um, so actually, this is uh, I read an article before I, I was even flown out there. Um, so they donate all that food, whether it's you know, to food banks, um, to different farms, to, you know, uh, all of that gets refurbished or repurposed in, in a different way. Um, and it's actually run, it, like you said, it's not an actual grocery store, but it's ran as an actual grocery store. You know, they have ex- expiration dates, you know, first in, first out, has to, of course, you know, because it's real food and we are cooking for, you know, people. So, that, you know, the, that mm-hmm. sanitation, safety and sanitation is absolutely paramount, especially on a production level. So, you know, being able to be on the show and, um, you know, seeing that and understanding that and reading that, um, and then actually going to experience that was just something, you know, like, wow, it was mind blowing. So um, Flavor Town, that's the name of the grocery store, um, was was tremendous. They have, I think I want to say over 30,000 different ingredients, wow. you know, that, that range over 100 different cuisines. So it was it was a daunting task. I won't, I won't lie to you. You know, it's like uh, I will say this, you know, they kind of, you know, before then, um, you know, before they say camera, you know, action, we're rolling. You know, you kind of get like a small tour of the of Flavor Town, and mind you, Chef, it's it's like wow, it's mind blowing. You know, like you're in a, a grocery store. You and I both know you might have your own local grocery store. I have my lo- own local grocery store. Um, it takes years to develop where everything is. You know, so yeah. being in Flavor Town, like you're like, oh my gosh, like where's the milk? Are oh, they in aisle one? Oh, and you're looking like where's aisle one? You know, so yeah, that was that. That also builds into the entertainment aspect as well. Yeah, so you got to have a strategy, like almost a mind map of where you're gonna go and where you think things are. And you have to exactly great. It's great to hear that they do donate it all and that they repurpose it, and that, and that makes sense. Right. So let's talk about American Culinary Federation. I know that's been a big part of your life since you know way back, and you're still very much involved in that. So let's say there's someone listening that knows nothing about it tell them you know sell it what's the value of acf and what can what can they get out of what have you gotten out of it and you know where do you see yourself going within the organization the federation 
Yeah, so um, American Culinary Federation, I'll uh, just give you a little bit of background about my affiliation. I started when I was in high school, uh, juniors, uh, just junior year to my senior year in high school. Um, my first ever chapter meeting was in Akron, Ohio. I actually met my mentor there. Uh, I met my you know, one of my mentors, Chef Stephen Beatty. You know, shout out to Chef Steve uh, listening on the call. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was just a, a tremendous experience, you know, being around industry professionals that were doing, you know, it in real time and what they offered young students, whether it was competitions, ACF apprenticeship, certification, you know, just them taking you under their wing and learning so much. I think you can attest to this too, Chef. Um, mentorship is huge, absolutely huge in our industry, you know, learning from somebody that has done it for years and years and years and doing it at a high level um, is, you know, is inspiring. And one of the reasons why, you know, young chefs go on stages you know, is to learn how an operation is running that or how, you know, their mentor, their favorite chef is running that. Um, for instance, you know, I did a stage at Emeralds Del Monaco um, by Emerald Lagasse. You know, I grew up watching Emeralds and, and for me to actually cook at one of his restaurants was life changing. So anyway, um, you know, with the ACF, the stands for American Continental Federation, as you said, chef, um, it's just, you know, an organization or federation, you know, comprised of chefs from all over the world um, who just are, um, committed to the betterment of, you know, sustainability for chefs um, with accreditation, ACF accreditation. I think we have over uh, 20 different accreditations for, you know, different obligations. We're all the way from the certified master chef to something more um, uh, rudimentary, you know, certified culinary. And, um, and, you know, and it's certification really matters. You know, certification really, really matters. You know, it can set you apart, whether it's with pay, whether it's, you know, uh, competitive salary, like I said, um, just, you know, you learning the ins and outs and, and how to do this. Um, I think at Johnson Wells, you know, it's a requirement that all of their um, faculty in terms of, of chef are accredited in some some way. So, um, you know, if you're looking to, to be, you know, a, a professor or a teacher or even, you know, just an executive chef, you know, later on in life, you know, it's definitely a, a, a definitely an organization that you want to get into. Um, more so than that, the networking. The networking has been extraordinary. Um, there's a, uh, an a individual on the uh, ACF board and, and uh, ACF staff by the name of Jackie Pressinger. Uh, she's my actual you know, liaison, and she's been instrumental in my growth as a young chef. Um, I, like I said, you know, outside of my parents, you know, with, if, without Jackie's support and guidance, I wouldn't be the young chef that I am you know, today. So uh, shout out to you, Jackie. Thank you so much for all that you do. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just uh, chef, you know, there's a wealth of knowledge, you know, and um, it's growing every day. And I know Chef Kimberly Brock Brown, you know, she was on here talking about it as well. Um, you know, it's it's growing, like I said, it's growing every day. It's becoming more diverse every day, you know. And for a young chef, you know, if you're looking to be part of something, a growing network, you know, you may not, you know, uh, have questions, you know, you know, or, or have uncertain, um, I guess, the comments or if anything like that, you know, that you want to just kind of figure out, you know, me being a part of the, you know, the, the network, the ACF, I can just go online to the ACF chef platform and just ask a question. And, you know, within an hour, 20 different chefs from all over the country can give me some advice. You know, so things like that, you know, it, it takes you right. a long way with that. One of the things that I like about it, <clears throat> I'm a member, is that it's not only a national organization, which gives it, you know, power in, in, in the industry and, mm -hmm. and uh, advocate for things, but it also it's at the local level. So you have those local chapters, which has, you know, you know what's going on in your neighborhood, in your town, in your city. And that's the big thing because, you know, it, what's happening in California would be different than what's in Maine and what's in Florida. So not only is it national, but then you look at those local meetings and there's, I find a lot of value in networking. Exactly. Do you belong to a local chapter? Maybe you could tell, like, what do you do at your local meetings? Right. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm at the Cleveland chapter, the ACF Cleveland chapter, um, ran by uh, Chef John Selleck. He's our president. Um, and also my coach for the ACF Student Chef of the Year competition, another great competition for, you know, any of the student chefs, you know, kind of, you know, when they, when they get into uh, competing. Um, so at, the, at our local level, you know, we do different things. So every Tuesday, Chef, right now, we go out to chefs, different chefs in our area. We go to a food bank um, and we cook for the less fortunate. So, you know, we kind of just... It's, it's like a, a chopped competition, to be honest with you, chef. You know, you kind of just go into the pantry, find out. You never know. Exactly. You have no idea what, what every, every week it changes. So, you know, we kind of just go in there, put our minds together, create a game plan. You know, we have three hours to cook for potentially up to 150 to 300, you know, um, citizens or, you know, people that receive our food. 
And uh, it's a tremendous experience. Like I said, it's very humbling, you know, allows us to, you know, to pick brains and kind of just come up, um, you know, with things together, you know. So that's one aspect. We do local meetings where we might go to breweries. Breweries are are really big in in Ohio, Um, you know, be able to, you know, learn how brewery, you know, um, the aspect of brewing. Um, go to different restaurants, you know, type into different restaurants. We'll have chefs that, you know, that do demonstrations. Um, unfortunately, now, you know, because of COVID and the restrictions, um, majority of that is virtual in terms of demoing and, and having, you know, different chefs on the platform. Um, but I'm certain once everything, you know, clears up, um, we'll be back in full swing. And they can find out about local chapters and the national chapter through the website, right? Which is, right. what is that website? Uh, I think it's uh, www.acfchefs.org. Or if you just Google ACF Chefs, you know, you'll be able to find it. And then you can look at local chapters. So if someone's listening right. to Kansas or Dakotas or somewhere, they mm-hmm. can find who their local chapter is, the list of presidents, and they can reach out and contact them and check it out. You don't have to be a member to go to a meeting just to, you know, find out and explore and, and get some exactly. And also, Chef, there's the, you know, the uh, ACF just enrolled a, a mentoring platform um, where I think it's you can um, sign on to be with the ACF for 60 days, I want to say, kind of just like a trial period, 30 or 60 days, for, forgive me for not knowing. Um, and you can I just see what the ACF is all about, you know, and also you can sign up for that mentoring platform. And if there's a chef that, you know, that you say, for instance, you're a student that is really into Asian cuisine and you kind of just want to learn more about it, you know, you can I just go on this platform type in all your information, um, what your interests are, and, you know, you can find a chef that's also doing, you know, Asian cuisine at a very high level and, you know, become a team mentor. So that's a, a great, you know, initiative, I think, as well, that that the ACF is doing. Yeah, there's a lot of free resources on there. I've seen some webinars, and I think you just had one on food trucks. So if someone's interested yes. in opening, operating food trucks or... That was a couple uh, of days ago. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, marijuana or dispensary or something right. and cooking with that and uh, catering. So there's a lot of information on this. It, you know, if you're interested and you're listening to this and you want to find out more information about the organization, go to their website, acfchefs.org. Yes. Tell me about your book. You wrote a book. What is it? Why did you write it? What was the inspiration for it? What's the title? Where can people find it? Sure. Um, a few of my favorites. Uh, we launched uh, in August of this year, or sorry, August of 2020. And it's um, just uh, like exactly how it sounds. A few of my favorites, a collection of 10 recipes that uh, I've created, you know, throughout my, uh, that are based upon, you know, my childhood, my experiences traveling abroad, you know, different things that I've, and also where I foresee the culinary future. Um, so, yeah, it was, you know, just uh, my father actually came up with the idea um, just as a marketing tool, you know, after I won guys grocery games, you know, we're looking to, you know, kind of, uh, invent my brand, if you will. And we thought no better idea than, or, uh, than to create a recipe book. So I got, got to work, you know, found, uh, you know, kind of just experimenting with, you know, different ingredients, you know, here in the local area. And I uh, just came up with 10 different recipes ranging from salads to appetizers, to entrees, you know, different things that, that I, you know, was, was comfortable making, uh, particularly, you know, Mediterranean uh, cuisine and Italian cuisine are, are some of my favorites. Um, dudes for the health, you know, benefit as well. So that's kind of an inspiration is, you know, with that. Um, but it's, yeah, you can find it at www.chefashton.com. That's my website and go on my store. There's a, we're running a discount 15% off right now. Um, if you'd like to purchase that. So yeah, it's just, a, you know, uh, just a, like I said, just a collection of recipes inspired by me, you know, for the betterment of you know, everybody else. Awesome. So that's how people can find you if someone wanted to follow you. What is some? What is your social media platforms? You just mentioned that one. If you could say it again, right. yeah. So put those in the. I'll put those in the show notes as well. Okay. Uh, so my website is www.shiftashton.com. I also have a YouTube blog called Beyond the Plate. Um, it's kind of just an inform- informative and educational blog for novice cooks and young chefs to get started. You know, we're, we're just doing things like vinaigrettes and how to cut different fruits and vegetables, things like that, and stuff that I learned in culinary school. Right. Um, so that's also on my website if you'd like to check that out. Um, my social media, my Instagram is am.garrett. Um, this am.garrett, that's my Instagram. LinkedIn, Ashton M. Garrett. Facebook, also Ashton M. Garrett. So uh, you can give me a follow. I'll follow you, follow you guys back. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, chefs, you know, that's, that's how they can find me. Awesome. Great. So what's next for you? Where do you see yourself going? What's your plans? A year from now, five years from now, long term? Uh, you did mention you wanted to open up a restaurant, but what is your path? So right now, Chef, um, it's, like I said, you know, with 
COVID kind of threw a monkey wrench as it did, you know, for our entire industry, you know, with that. But, you know, we're resilient. You know, we're, we're going to I think we're going to come back harder than than ever before. And it's going to be you know a great turning point for our industry. Um, but as of right now, it's just, you know, continue to build my brand, continue to build, you know, the wealth of knowledge that I'm doing, um, you know, just just being you know, with different opportunities, uh, learning. Um, I would like to get into the Michelin, you know, level um, and, and cook there, you know, whether it's abroad or something, you know, more more internal um, and just learn from different chefs, wherever that that might be. You know, I'm not I'm not too certain. I would love to, you know, go back to Italy and probably cook over there some more. Um, but as, as it stands, you know, I'll be competing in the ACF Student Chef of the Year um, here in August that will be held in Orlando, Florida. Um, I, I'm proud to announce that I'm also the, uh, I was appointed to be the ACF National Young Chefs Club president. So, you know, that's, that's been a tremendous opportunity for me thus far. And we're just continuing to build. So, but five years from now, Chef, yeah, I just, you know, I, I think I want to be molding my my career path, you know, continuing to learn, continuing to grow. I can't tell you exactly where that looks like now. Like I said, I hopefully it's at a, a, a higher level, you know, whether it's Michelin or, you know, more of a prestigious fine dining hotel, you know, with St. Regis or, or uh, you know, Rich Carlton. But, you know, wherever the case may be, I just want to give it my all and be surrounded by, you know, great interactive, influential people that, you know, that are dedicated to the craft of cooking and, and want to be, you know, um, want to be, you know, uh, an inspiration for others, you know, help others. But I think long term, you know, some of the, some of the goals I have long term is um, being an advocate for um, world hunger. You know, I, I think that there's no place you know, on this planet for world hunger. I, I don't think, you know, any mouths should be not fed. Um, I also want to be, you know, food sustainability, as you know, chef, you know, um, our, our food sustainability is, is paramount right now, whether it's with agriculture or with, um, you know, oceans and things like that. So sustainable, um, sustainable resources for culinarians and also chef, you know, um, see, see what that Michelin level looks like, you know, try, try something out. Awesome. So you say you're the president of the young chefs, uh, yes, association club. or club. Uh, is there, when do you become an old chef? Yeah. Is there an age cut off there? Yeah. So it's, um, so 18 to 25 <laughs> is the, uh, young chefs club, like kind of like age. Little. Young chefs. And then you're the old chef. Right. Yeah. So after, after 25 on my 25th or my 26th birthday, yeah, I'll, I'll be considered a, you know, an older chef, but they haven't broken down, you know, where you're a student. Um, I, I think I want to say it's student, student apprentice. And maybe like more like a leader or, or you know or, or worker kind of things like that. That's kind of how they have it broken down. I'm not too sure, but I know it's definitely student, and then from there it's like another level. And then you can become a senior chef or veteran. <laughs> right. Yep. Senior or or director or you know different things like that. Awesome. So as we get close to the end here, I'd like to ask: um, Is there any last minute advice or guidance that you could leave with the listeners? Maybe there's someone out there that's thinking about going to culinary school is wants to follow the path they're they're on the fence on it or they're maybe even thinking about just getting in this industry what's some advice that you would give them or guidance uh first things first get yourself into the industry at any capacity you possibly can i understand that jobs are scarce right now um and you know our industry is extremely volatile, um, but still, you know, try to try what, at any capacity you possibly can get yourself into this industry. Um, you know, it gets you, learning is is the best way, you know, for any, you know, to gain any experience. I think, um, you know, the old school saying some things are better explained and some things are better experienced. I um, mean, in, in this case, you want to experience it. You, know, you want to go out into the industry, see exactly what it's like. Um, so that's that's my first piece. Second piece of uh, find great mentorship. And you often find great mentorship while you go through the, this process of learning and experimenting and, and finding different things like that. Um, and just network your butt off, you know, like find different chefs. You know, like I met Chef Roach um, you know, in 2016, 2017. And, and to have this call, you know, three, three, four years later is uh, because of our networking. You know, so somebody knows somebody who knows somebody else, you know, and um, our industry has changed, like I said, every day. And you can use that as a platform to help boost you up um, in, in, in your ability. So as it turns into culinary school, you know, you definitely want to weigh, you know, apples to apples. Think about, you know, where you want to go, why you want to go there, you know, what specific program, um, find out about the faculty, you know, learn, learn some things about there. When I 
decided to go to Johnson and Wells. I did research on possibly, you know, every chef down there, you know, and uh, I wanted to understand the history of Johnson and Wells, you know, starting up in Providence and making its way down to, um, you know, Miami, Florida, and even the Denver campus as well. So research, you know, learn more about it, reach out to the recruiters, you know, ask them for, for different information um, and get started on your scholarships early on, guys. You know, there's also grants programs. You can do loan forgiveness. There, there's so many different ways. If you want to be there, you'll find a way to be there. You know, so don't don't stop. Don't ever give up. You know, keep pushing forward. Um, and then my last piece, Chef, that I would like to you know provide is uh, stay patient and always stay prepared. Um, you know, one of my mentors said, you know, he told me, he said, Ashton, it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared for it at all. So for the young chefs out there right now, you know, continue to practice knife cuts, work on your skills, you know, measurements, all these things, although they are mundane and probably, you know, like, um, forgive me for using this word stupid, um, but they're going to help you, you know, because practice creates, you know, better practice, which creates progression and progression creates efficiency. And while you're in this industry, efficiency is, is the key to the game. You know, you always want to be as, as efficient as possible. So um, I hope that helps. You know, if, if you guys want to reach out to me, like I said, you know, Chef has my links. Uh, I'll be more than willing to talk to you and help you out some more. Um, Chef, thank you so much for, for having me on this podcast. It was a, a tremendous pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, great. I think that uh, hospitality industry industry in a whole, it will help anybody. I mean, that's why we're in this business. Right. So as you just offered yourself, I think, you know, most people will do the same. So, you know, if you see someone, a chef in your local area or teacher, instructor, don't be afraid, reach out. I mean, worst I'll say is no, but I bet 99.9, .9, they're going to answer your question and we'll be able to help you and give you free advice. Right. And that's all it takes, you know, just, just that free advice, you know, and that's, that's, um, you know, something that you should cherish for the rest of your life. You know, like that's, that's some, you know, them giving themselves to you, you know, that wealth of knowledge, that wealth of experience, you know, um, you, know you can learn so many things in a book, but like, like I said, once you're out there doing it and you're learning it from somebody, you know, who has done it for years and years and years, it's just a tremendous experience. Right. And these chefs have so much knowledge that they don't need it anymore. They want to give it away. <laughs> right. Exactly. They're done with it. <laughs> right. Yo, let me pass it on. Yo, let me pass it on. Excellent. Well, that's just about all the time we have for this episode. And I want to first thank you, Ashton, for coming on the show and sharing your culinary school story with all of us. Really appreciate you sharing that, your time, your honesty, your insight. Thank you very much. Chef, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, for anybody viewing, view more of Chef Roach. Please, please, please. He is doing an incredible, incredible service for our industry. And uh, we really appreciate him. Thank you, Chef. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed our chat. Bye-bye now. Take care, Chef. Thank you. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. Or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. That's area code 207-835-1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you. And that is to share the podcast with everyone you know. And to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next culinary school story, take care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network.